Well, good morning. Um, this is the preliminary chit chat to let those of you who like to listen live um, connect. And Graham's doing something with his phone, so I hope it's all okay. As will be obvious, we are back in our usual venue in the little church in Blackburn, in Melbourne. Um, yes, back from our lovely holiday in Bondi, where we recorded last Sunday's service. Um, as most of you know, if not all of you, we Melbourne is back in lockdown, but we are allowed to come to church to stream the service. And so here we are. Um, it's sad to be back in lockdown, but we hope that the powers that be are getting the virus back under control. And of course, that involves hoping and praying that every citizen will do the right thing. Um, there's been several ups breaches of lockdown, which wouldn't be which would be absurd if they weren't serious. Um, I think the biggest party I've heard of police being asked to break up had 60 people at it. They've gone to parties and found people hiding in cupboard as if this was a game. And just yesterday we heard that someone who really likes the butter chicken he normally has in the CBD, the Central Business District of Melbourne, decided he would have some despite the lockdown. He just happens to live 30 kilometres away. So I don't know what he actually paid for the takeaway butter chicken, but he was fined $1,652. So I hope it tasted very, very good because I'm sure it's the most expensive butter chicken anyone has bought. So this should be, we should be in lockdown, I think till the 19th of August. And if the numbers are good then, for a second time round will start a gradual easing and I know those of you who are listening from interstate and overseas are at different stages in your localities fight against this horrible widespread virus. So this is me just coming up to 11 o'clock and I will hand over Graham to, be, to Graham to begin the service proper. Thank you, Christine. And a warm welcome to Blackburn Presbyterian Church this morning. My name is Graham, as Christine suggested, and I'm the minister here, and uh, we normally meet in this venue. Thank you for joining us for this stream service, which we've been doing since uh, the 22nd of March. Uh, we've been streaming uh, a modified service because, of course, the COVID uh, virus has affected pretty well everything and you've probably found us via our Facebook page you can also find us on the web page it's blackburnpc.org.au if you'd like to learn a little bit more about us and you can also download the uh, weekly leaflet uh, there which contains an outline of what I'm going to say uh, although this week's isn't posted yet it usually gets posted on a Monday or, or a Tuesday so if you'd like to uh, learn more or review what we've been learning and studying together as we open God's Word week by week, please do that. We uh, usually begin with prayer, and wherever you're viewing, I'd like to invite you to pause with us and to seek God's presence at this moment. So shall we pray together? Almighty God, we come to you at Jesus' invitation thinking of you as a loving parent, our Father indeed, our Father in heaven. And we ask that by your Holy Spirit, you would be present with us as we open the scriptures and think about them together, and as we seek to bring our lives under your oversight and influence. We pray that your presence will guide us and that your light will shine on our path. We ask Heavenly Father, that you would bless your word wherever it is open today, even if the church doors are closed, wherever the Bible is opened, throughout the world, on internet, and in every, any other way, we pray that people will find themselves drawn near to the one who is the way and the truth and the life. 
Hear our prayer and be with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Christine uh, is going to bring us a segment which we call Young at Heart. So, Christine, thank you. I think most of you know that our youngest daughter lives in Bondi with her husband and children. And I think you also know that we love going to Bondi. So we had planned to go there on July the 9th. This was when the first lockdown was well and truly eased for travel. And we, we, that was our plan. And we learned then on Monday the 6th of July that at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, actually, that the New South Wales government was going to close the border to all people from Melbourne at midnight that night. And so we packed in a bit of a scramble um, and we crossed the border on the Monday night at 9 o'clock, so three hours before it was closed to our to Melburnians. Um, they were probably very right to do this because we had a serious rise in case numbers in Victoria. Now, there's lots we like about being in Bondi. Um, we're beach lovers, but this wasn't quite so much the time of year for the beach, although we did have one swim. But one of the things we always enjoy is going for walks along the cliff tops with some wonderful views. Um, see this beautiful one of the cliffs and the next one shows you the view back to Sydney with the Sydney Harbour Bridge um, in the background on the right. However, we were puzzled by these markings which appeared on the ground at regular intervals. So all done in white paint, it looked like. And then we came across these concrete squares. Then came a warning of workmen ahead and then all became clear. We saw these little poles and on the top of these little poles, the solar panels. So solar lights are being installed so that the paths can be safely walked even during the hours of darkness. I wanted to share these pictures with you. Um, and I'm sorry, I haven't been looking at you, I've been looking at the pictures. I wanted to share them because I just like think, things like that, which you see happening before your eyes, and which are perhaps a reflection of what a prosperous, fortunate society most of us in Australia live in. Sadly, not all of us, but um, we enjoyed finding this out. Of course, into my mind came the motto of the school that I taught at for 21 years. It is Lex Dei Vitae Lampus. I'm not sure about my Lampus, about my Latin pronunciation, but I did learn during those years that V is now pronounced W, or it was then. This is the Latin version of Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. There are times in our lives when the way ahead seems bright and clear. There's others when it's hard to see where we're headed. The pandemic of COVID-19 has made life uncertain for all of us, but very uncertain for those who have lost loved ones, become chronically ill or lost their jobs. Whatever stage of life we are in, it's helpful for us to regularly read the Bible and to ask God to grant us his spirit to understand it and to help us apply it in our lives. When I was young, in the middle of the 20th century, Learning poems, speeches, often from Shakespeare, and passages of the Bible, learning these by heart 
was the norm in Scottish education. I think that's probably now called rote learning and no longer fashionable. However, I think learning things by heart still has an important place. And for those of you who are young in years and not just young at heart, I would suggest that you discuss with your parents what passages of the Bible it might be helpful for you to learn now. They will stay with you forever. And may God continue to shine his light on our path. Thank you, Christine. Well, we're going to turn to the Bible now and to hear it read to us. We're looking at Matthew 26 uh, and 27, but uh, Ian is going to read to us. Ian Rutherford uh, has sent us a clip of him reading this part of uh, Matthew's Gospel. So we'll, we'll listen to Ian reading to us. Thank you, Ian. The reading today is Matthew 26, verses 1 to 19. Thank you very much, Ian. And now we come to uh, reflect on where we've been going. And we began way back uh, early in the year with the Sermon on the Mount. I thought it would be good for us to look at the foundations of Jesus' message to the world. Uh, and we've journeyed from the, the Sermon on the Mount through Matthew's Gospel, picking up five markers uh, now, I've called them route markers because, like highway signs, they keep reminding you of the journey that you're on. This is a highway sign that we uh, picked up on on the, on the way back uh, from uh, Sydney last week. Uh, I've put it on the front of the leaflet if you, if you wish to uh, look on the, on the uh, church's webpage. It says, COVID-19, Victorian border control in force. Now, that was a lot easier to get into Victoria than it was to get out of it. And uh, you'll see that the road on the, on the pictures is totally empty. We came back along a pretty well-deserted Hume Freeway. So 
Where, are we, where is Matthew taking us? That's, that's our question today. Well, remember the root markers. These, these are the five that we've looked at. Uh, after the Sermon on the Mount, it says, when Jesus had finished these words, and we get the idea that that's a whole bracket of his teaching. And then further on, when Jesus had finished teaching his disciples in chapter 10, at verse 11, uh, Matthew reminds us that that's another bracket of teaching. And then in chapter 13, we get the parables of the kingdom. Uh, and, and Jesus says at the end of that chapter, when Jesus had finished these parables. So Luke packages those, uh, Matthew packages those for us. And then we saw at the end of chapter uh, 18, which is the beginning of 19, when Jesus had finished these words. And then the fifth time in chapter 26, referring to the previous three chapters, when Jesus had finished all these words. So we've got the root markers there. The question is, where does Matthew want us to arrive? Well, that's what Ian has read to us today. Uh, and I'm going to call our reflection this morning a good and beautiful thing. In fact, Matthew has brought us to a kind of a high point, but it's like the edge of a precipice. There's going to be so much happening in the next few chapters uh, that it's, uh, well, it's become known as the greatest story ever told. It's become known as the Passion of the Christ. It's the suffering of God's anointed one, the Messiah, the Son of God, and the Son of Man. So it's a great narrative that's impacted Western history in, in a way that we can barely begin to imagine. And all I want to do this morning is to look at some, not all, because there's a large cast in these pages, but I want to look at some of the key players uh, and see what we can learn as we sort of look at what we've learned about the kingdom in the teaching of Jesus and his own sense of what he came to do and see where that brings us. And, and the, the key players uh, are Caiaphas. You heard Ian mention the chief priest whose name was Caiaphas. And Judas, who came into the picture. We haven't heard about Peter, but just a little bit further on in the narrative, we hear about Peter. And I invite you to read in your own Bible, chapter 26, and, and see it for yourself. And then after the appearance before the chief priest and the Sanhedrin, Jesus is taken to Pilate. And Pilate comes up with uh, another name, the name Barabbas. And then finally, I want to come back to the woman who's not named in the story, but whom we know from John's Gospel, was a woman called Mary. So these are the six characters that I want to spend a few minutes with as we look at this tumultuous period, this time in Jesus' life, when he comes to the climax, how it all adds up. Well, first of all, Caiaphas. Now, Caiaphas was the chief priest. He was the temple custodian. He was responsible for the way the temple was administered and how it ran. And, of course, the temple was God's house. It was where the unseen and eternal God had a kind of presence in the middle of the city. He was with his people. And the significance of the temple was that God is with them. And it was a place where atonement was made for sin because nobody is worthy to have God with them. But God yearns for that. He wants to be with us. And he seeks to overcome our sin. And so there was atonement, there was sacrifice. There was the assurance of forgiveness at the temple. The high priest was the overseer of it all. But if we'd read carefully through Matthew's Gospel, we would have found in chapter 21... And it's recorded in the other Gospels as well that Jesus cleansed the temple and he declared that it was a, a den of robbers. It was a place of merchandise. They were interested in buying and selling and making money. And so Jesus momentarily halted the sacrifices which had been going on and on and on as they should have been. But they were focused wrongly. They'd become a means of a livelihood. It was an establishment. And Jesus was perceived as a troublemaking rabbi. And he foretold the destruction of the temple and indeed the city. But nobody seemed to be able to provide a clear charge against Jesus. John's Gospel tells us 
that uh, the high priest said it's important that one person die for the people because he was concerned if there was unrest the Romans would crush it down and there would be a bloodbath as it were. So John tells us in chapter 11 verse 50 it was better for one man to die for the people and the high priest didn't realize that his words were prophetic. And Jesus appears before Caiaphas and doesn't speak. Except when Pilate, when, when uh, Caiaphas puts him on oath and Jesus accepted that he was the Messiah. And he uses the language of Daniel, one of the prophets who was clearly in Jesus' mind at this time. You will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. So here is Jesus uh, accepting the messianic title. It was an important part of Jesus' self-understanding. But Caiaphas realized that he was making himself equal with God. This is a blasphemy, he said, and he deserves to die. And calm would prevail once the troublemaker was disposed of. And they determined that they would get rid of Jesus. Caiaphas. But then we're introduced to Judas. They were helped in their determination to get rid of Jesus by Judas, whose name has become synonymous with betrayal. I hesitate to speak of Judas because there is so much that could be written and said and indeed has been written and said about Judas and indeed all the characters that we're looking at today. But the gospel re Gospels repeat with astonishment that he was one of the twelve. One of the twelve. He was also their treasurer. But we're told that he pilfered money. But does that explain his uh, betrayal of Jesus? It seems to me that there was a kind of mismatch between his aspirations for power because we know that the disciples couldn't see clearly what Jesus was getting at. That James and John had wanted the chief seats in the kingdom that he spoke about and perhaps that was what Judas wanted too. He wanted power but he could see there was a mismatch between what Jesus was saying because Jesus kept saying that he was going to die. He talked about it. And on the third day, rise again. So perhaps he felt that he wasn't going to achieve what he wanted. And he decided to betray Jesus to the chief priest, to lead, him, lead them to him and for a sum of money. It just so happens that the language that's used there comes from the prophet Zechariah. The price that was paid, 30 pieces of silver, a betrayal. Later, of course... Judas was filled with remorse at what he'd done. And he came back to the temple to see the priests. I've betrayed innocent blood, he said. What's that to us, they said. There was no forgiveness at the temple. They didn't concern themselves with him. Remember, the temple had ceased to be what it should have been. It should have been a place where atonement was made and forgiveness was offered. But the priests weren't into that. And Judas didn't find it there. It had ceased to provide atonement and offer God's love and mercy to sinners. It had already ceased to be the place where God's love and purposes were being enacted. In fact, they were being enacted somewhere else now. And uh, the, the house of God, the temple in Jerusalem, like the, the house at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, was actually founded on sand. And as Jesus had foretold, it would be destroyed. Then we come to Peter. And again, so much has been written about Peter. Uh, he, it's remarkable that all four Gospels record this event, that Peter denied his master three times. It was embarrassing. It was even shameful. A triple denial. Not only was he one of the twelve, he was one of the inner circle of three, Peter, James, and John. How often do we read Peter, James, and John was taken by Jesus to this and that situation? He was the de facto uh, leader and speaker of the group. And yet, the questions of a servant girl, that he might be Galilean and might be connected with the man who was being tried in the courts of the Sanhedrin and so on, made him fearful. And so he denied that he even knew him. He not only denied it, he went on oath, he swore he didn't know him. 
Now, if it's close, if it's true that someone's so close to Jesus uh, during his earthly sojourn, and who was privy to so many things that are astonishing and wonderful, if he, out of fear, uh, could deny Jesus, I, I think of what might you and I be capable, how uncomfortable could our Christianity be? You know, it, we live in a fairly unthreatening environment, but around the world there are Christians who have experienced great hostility. And uh, the idea that uh, they struggle with their faith, just like those early Christians in the centuries following the events of this chapter uh, were persecuted, they must have found comfort in the idea that, G that even Peter, who, who denied his Lord, could be brought back from that place of denial because he found restoration and he found a renewed place of leadership. I think it must have brought enormous encouragement to Christians in the early years of persecution of the church and even today our fellow sisters and brothers who trust Jesus Christ and are in hostile situations uh, may be challenged by tyranny or by terror can find comfort in Peter's story. But the next person in the story that I want to pick up on is Pilate. He's the empire spokesman. In this story, he represents the Roman system of justice. And his opening question, are you the king of the Jews, makes it clear that the Jewish council had handed him over with the blasphemy as his charge. If he was a king, then he was a challenger to Caesar. And Pilate should be interested in anybody who challenged Caesar. But Pilate's aware that the Jewish leadership wants rid of Jesus, and he suspects their motive, but he's troubled by their insistence. He was unconvinced that Jesus was a threat, and he sought to set him free. It appears that he discussed it with his wife, and she had uh, a nightmare about it, have nothing to do with that innocent man. But there was a custom at Passover time. I don't know if you've noticed, but the uh, word Passover keeps popping up in this narrative. There was a custom at Passover time that, uh, that Pilate could set a, a condemned person free uh, as, a, as an act of goodwill and grace to the people. And so he had a prisoner. The prisoner's name happened to be Jesus Barabbas. The, uh, the name Jesus was a very common name. It's the name we get our word Joshua from. Uh, and so in an era when people were feeling restless and there was a desire for uh, freedom from the overlords of Rome, uh, Joshua uh, was, a, was, a, was a common enough name. So here is the man we know as Barabbas. Uh, and there's this Barabbas, Jesus Barabbas, or there's Jesus whom you call the Messiah. Which one do you want? And you know the story. The crowds uh, gathered to call out whom they wanted and the priests seeding the crowd so that they wanted Barabbas set free and Jesus they wanted crucified. That's what Pilate imagined, was the opposite of what Pilate imagined. But Pilate, Barabbas was a brigand leader and he's going to be set free. He, he, has, he says nothing in the story. Uh, you can imagine his perplexity. Taken from jail, he's a condemned man. He's been involved in murder, a dangerous prisoner. And yet the crowd were persuaded to prefer him in chapter 27 verse 20 to the one called Messiah. Encouraged by the religious leadership then, they called for him to be free and he's set free because someone else dies in his place. But isn't that what the Passover, Israel's great freedom celebration was all about? A lamb was killed, its blood marked the, the door of the house, the angel of death passed over, Egypt's firstborn died and the people were set free. It's a freedom celebration. And here is Barabbas, set free, because another is going to die. 
Now on the leading edge of all this drama, we have Mary and her costly devotion. Jesus has a meal at her house uh, at, at which the unnamed, in Matthew's gospel, this unnamed woman anoints him with a vial of precious ointment. It is so precious that it, it uh, was worth a lot of money and it could have been used for all, all kinds of things. The disciples rebuked Mary, and a waste, they said. She broke the vial, which probably was valuable in itself, and she poured the, uh, the perfume, perfumed oil uh, on Jesus. And Jesus, in the face of the criticism of the, of the disciples, said, she has done a fine and beautiful thing for me. And I've called this talk a good and beautiful thing. Because that's the way Jesus describes what Mary has done. The word, there are two words for good, and one of the words means not only morally good, but it, it means beautiful or aesthetically good. So these words are both there, and they speak about something that is in, has merit in its own right as a kind of moral thing, but it also is a lovely thing. So Jesus is appreciating the loveliness of her action. What did she see? Well, she saw sacrificial love. Now, Professor Tasker says, Mary sees the shadow of a cross lying heavily upon him. He'd been talking about it, so Mary had been listening. And she penetrates its meaning. She knows he is ready and willing to die as a supreme act of love for his friends. And she rightly reckons herself and her family among those friends. And so she pours the fragrant perfume, her most costly possession, over his head, as though she were anointing a king. When the gospel is preached, when you hear about the love of Jesus, we should be reminded of this woman's devotion, because her response is her own personal mirroring of what she's seeing happening in front of her. She sees his love and commitment, and she makes her own love and commitment obvious to them all, and it is a good and a beautiful thing. But what might our lives reveal that we are devoted to? Where are the extravagant things that we do that show what is precious to us? Well, there are many contenders. In this story, three already have appeared that struck me. Money is there, power is there, security is there. We might be wanting these things. These might be the most precious things to us. Money, power, security. Mary was different. She saw a person who was about to make a sacrifice for his people. She saw a king who was bringing in a new kind of kingdom a new kind of lordship over people that invites them to a family. She sees him doing the most extravagant thing. And so, so through the turmoil of all the players in the story that follow her mirroring of Jesus, uh, we see Jesus himself committing to us. With whom do you identify in the story? It's worth thinking about. And you and your, yourself and your family, uh, do you reckon uh, them among the, the Jesus' friends? What a beautiful statement that is of Tasker's. She reckoned, she rightly reckons herself and her family among those friends. Her brother who had had leprosy and was healed by Jesus. Martha, her sister, so overactive in the kitchen. Um, she knows that a, their house is a place where Jesus loves to be. And she had listened to him. That was what she was known for. She was listening at the master's feet. And she had taken on board what he was doing. And she knew that nothing that she gave could adequately restore or repay the grace and the love and the mercy that he was showing. Amen. Now, shall we come to a time of prayer? Let us uh, take a few minutes and um, bring to God some prayers of intercession. I've included the Barnabas Fund.
prayer for today. Barnabas Fund is an agency, uh, it's an, actually a charity registered in the UK, and it uh, supports Christians in hostile situations. And it seems very appropriate that we use their prayer for today as well. So let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that the good news of Jesus Christ speaks to us of your immeasurable love and profound commitment to us all. Help us to enter fully into the forgiveness and freedom of your family. Like Mary, may we give what is most precious in service to you, our Lord and King. O God of love, in these difficult times when many have lost their jobs and some have suffered terrible hunger and deprivation due to COVID lockdown, fill us to overflowing with your love, a love that never fails, but always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Keep us from selfishness or greed when resources are scarce. Make us generous, cheerful givers who show our love and practical care for those in need as we continue to trust in Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who will provide. May we show forth the love of Jesus in whose name we pray. As Victoria experiences a second wave of COVID-19 and we share a renewed lockdown, we ask for protection for frontline healthcare workers and for all who maintain essential services. May our whole community embrace the challenge of caring for one another. Grant us the love and energy of your Holy Spirit that we may play our part by keeping in touch with friends and neighbors who may be vulnerable because of age, the care of others, especially those with health concerns, and small children. We know it is the poor who suffer most in this pandemic. Grant genuine care to those who govern, that with wisdom they may protect impoverished families. Help us to participate with agencies that extend the reach of the wealthy nations to impoverished brothers and sisters. These things we pray in the name of our Lord and Saviour, who taught us to pray together and say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon you and guide you into his joy in the future. For his namesake we pray. Amen. <laughs>